For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is archaeologist Andrew Smith to discuss his book titled First People, The Lost History of Khoisan. What sparked your interest in the background of the Khoisan referred to now as the First People of Southern Africa? Well, I worked with herding people in North Africa, in the Sahara, as part of my doctoral research. So my interest in herding people, pastoral people of Africa started there. When I came to Cape Town, it was an obvious choice to deal with herding people in Southern Africa, particularly South Africa, who are the Khoikhoin. And then that expanded to interests in working with the Bushmen as well. So Khoisan, both herders and hunters, became part of my research. We are thinking about the world in an academic sense as well. And can you also give us some background into the origins of the Khoisan group and where they are in South Africa now? It's quite complicated because most people do not know who are Khoisan descendants, really how that word, that name comes about. The name is actually a colonial name, Khoi and San being put together, but they're two different groups of people. They are hunters, Bushmen, San, and herders, the Khoikhoin, pastoralists. Now they come from different histories. And if we look at the deep history, we have to recognize in Southern Africa, there are three distinct languages. Two Bushman languages and the Khoi. And none of these people can speak to each other because the languages are so different. And in fact, the Bushman languages, two of them, Northern Namibia, is the Jew language in, in southern Namibia and in South Africa at one time, but it's virtually gone extinct. The people can't speak to each other. They've been separated for probably 30,000 years. That's a very long time. <laughs> so there are two groups of, of Bushmen who can't speak to each other. That's the first thing to recognize. And then Khoi, it's just separate. And Khoi probably did not come from South Africa. They came from the outside. Certainly, the herding people, came through Africa, all the way from the Sahara into East Africa, and from East Africa, they came to South Africa 2,000 years ago. So we're dealing with two quite separate groups of people. In the beginning of the book, uh, you write about the Dutch who usually refreshed their ships in the Cape, but then things changed uh, after they realized that the Cape could be agriculturally productive. Can you tell us about that? Well, just, just think about what the Cape is in a, a rainfall sense. It's winter rainfall, right? And that's one reason why the black people from the Eastern Cape didn't migrate into the Western Cape because they had summer rainfall crops, mm -hmm. sorghum and millet. Now, when the Dutch arrived, they brought in their winter rainfall crops, <laughs> which do very well at the Cape. You know, wheat and, and rye and, and things like that, you see. So when they found out they could do that, they got a different way of looking at the Cape. Instead of just being a stopover to get meat and water, they became productive in, in an agricultural sense. And mm -hmm. so they then gave the rights to uh, free burgers to set up their farms. Now, that's a very interesting point in itself because the Khoisan people, particularly Khoi Khoin, who they knew very well at the Cape, didn't have boundaries to their land. No fences. Everybody used the la land in a common sense, right? But when you bring in fences, as farmers do, you change the whole uh, world in a, a very distinct way, particularly for herders who use the land, we call it transhumans, moving across the space seasonally. It's destructive because it's it putting in a barrier to their movement so their seasonal movement. Is that uh, the idea? How that should the difference between the Dutch and the Khoi Khoi in themselves? Who was your target group when you wrote this book? Was there a specific group that you were targeting? Yes, specifically the Khoi San descendants. Mm -hmm. People who were, whose families or their ancestors were Khoi San, were hunters and herders in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And there's been a big gap in the teaching in schools and the history, discussion, even where the Khoisan came from, because they've been marginalized, pushed aside by succeeding governments, you know, 
first it was the Dutch, then it became, and then became the, the post-colonial period. And there's no language, no Khoisan language recognized as an official language in South Africa. So there is, a you understand, the degree of marginalization which has, has, has taken place. So my book is to try to resolve some of the background issues to tell people about where they come from and give them a history. Talking about them being marginalized, their representatives are demanding official First Nation um, recognition. They do not want to be classified as colored. Also, there is now a legal action uh, to stop the development of the Amazon Africa headquarters on a historical site. Do you hope that your book will perhaps bring better context to both issues? Well, my book is dealing with the, the historic past, the deep historic past primarily, where the Khoisan came from. It's not really involved with these modern political issues, except I, mm. I accept the point that there has been a need to be recognized within the, the governmental structures. The question in my mind is, I don't think necessarily the government structures, which have been patriarchal, i.e. male-dominated, tends to be the model that the Khoisan need to go. They have to recognize both men and women have equal rights, particularly to the land. Why is it so important uh, for us to trace the beginnings of this group and to understand their journey? The Bushmen themselves, as I call them Bushmen, because when I worked with them in, in the Kalahari, they don't mind being called Bushmen, not necessarily San. And, and they think of the word San, Sanqua, Sonqua. That is a pejorative used by the Khoikhoin against the Bushmen because San were people lower, of lower status. They didn't have any domestic animals. So that put them at the bottom of the, the hierarchy. So where this, the Bushmen come from, modern people are descended from the, the, the most genetically complex people in the world. And those are the San. Those are the Bushmen today. So we may be derived, we, all of us, from the ancestors of the Bushmen, who, as modern people, arose almost 300,000 years ago. It's a long time ago, right? They were here, their ancestors, the Bushmen, were here in South Africa 300,000 years ago. So we're de dealing with a very long history of hunters who their immediate ancestors are certainly 20,000 years ago. We can almost identify with them. That language, uh, a difference I told you about 30,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, that tells us that the people who are living today, and we call them Bushmen or San, they're the, the direct descendants of those. Now, the Khoi are, are, are different. The Khoi were dealing with domestic animals. That was their, uh, the basis of their economy. They come in domestic animals, are not indigenous to Africa, the ones we think today, cattle and sheep, they come from the outside of Africa. They come mm. from the Near East. And they come into Africa 8,000 years ago, into the Sahara, which was not desert in those days. Mm. By 4,000 years ago, they're in East Africa because Sahara started to dry up and people then moved southwards and some of them moved into East Africa. Mm -hmm. They then stayed there for a while and learned how to deal with the, the environment in East Africa. Then they moved to South Africa. And there was a, an open corridor that allowed them to come to South Africa into the Kalahari. So mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago, we see the first domestic animals arriving. And that mm -hmm. means it's the direct descendants of the Khoi Khoi. But what happens then is that the herds separate into cattle and sheep. And certainly the sheep are the ones which then move southwards to the Cape. Just shepherds with almost no cattle. They come to the Cape with their sheep. And we've got very good records, very nice sites. We've worked on with lots of sheep bones, but almost no cattle bones. But we know the first people being met by the first travelers, the Portuguese, in the, in the 15th century, they saw large cattle herds. Now the question is, where do those cattle heads come from and when do they come? And it turns out, we have good uh, archaeological evidence, that a thousand years ago, there was a change in the herd structure. The animals then are mostly, well, they're, they're, there's a very dominance of, uh, of, of cattle because people are starting to drink milk. There's a shift in the isotopic record in skeletons a thousand years ago. At the same time, a thousand years ago, there's a change in pottery style. 
before a thousand years ago with the shepherds. They've got spouted pottery, but with, with pouring spouts. After a thousand years ago, with a large herd of cattle, they've got lugs. They've got little holding ears that you can put a, a thread through, then tie it onto a back of an oxen. So a thousand years ago, we've got a change. But that thousand years ago is also when we see the growth of cattle herds among the uh, Nguni-speaking people, or the, the, the Bantu speakers. It's called the later Iron Age. So Kosa, Zulu, uh, Tswana, they see large herds of cattle at, at just about the same time, a thousand years ago, perhaps slightly before. So mm -hmm. it can be a coincidence that they'll get large herds of cattle and the Koi start to have large herds of cattle too. And I think that's where the, her the cattle has come from, the Eastern Cape, and it moves gradually to the Western Cape. In, in chapter four, then you, you talk about a rock art symbolism, where you say that uh, the later Stone Age hunter gatherers they used to communicate spiritual ideas on uh, the rock walls of caves. Can you briefly tell us about the theories that have come from the rock art interpretations? Yes, yeah, so that, that, there's a lot of, of discussion among the specialists about what the meaning of the art is. Mm. But one main thread is that the art is spiritual, mm -hmm. that it was done to communicate spiritual experiences within mm -hmm. the group. And the image of a trancer, person in a trance experience, going into altered states of consciousness, writing or drawing his experience or her experience on the walls mm -hmm. of caves. Mm. So that, that's what one uh, a, a very strong theory. The unfortunate thing is that when people were painting, uh, no one was asking those questions in the 19th century, you see. So many of the, the interpretations are coming from what we know of modern Bushman society today, but there are no painters, you see. So it, it is an interpretation. I don't think anybody disagrees, though, that the rock art is spiritual, it's meant to be communicative. It's a form of language, you might say, mm -hmm. among people who didn't have any written language, but they knew how to communicate ideas. But these are very deep meaning, and it's the bringing back uh, potency or power back from the, the spirit world to heal people physically and socially. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that most people would agree that that's the power. And one thing that, that tells us, perhaps, that that's the case, the rock wall is seen as a veil between the spirit world in the rock, the real world outside the rock. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you see animals coming through cracks in the rock, coming from the inside, you see, coming into the real world. So this is suggested then that we're dealing with a transformation from one world to the other. But remember, the Bushmen do not separate the real world from the spirit world, much like we would do. We separate, separate the two and say, well, that's spirit, this is, this is, this is uh, no real. That's not the way the Bushmen think of the world. The spirit world is very much part of their daily lives. And so they have to in interact with, in the case it's the rock art, is one way of interacting with the spirit world. And there's a section uh, in the book where you discuss the Bushmen uh, diorama. For those who don't know uh, about this exhibition, can you tell us about it and about why it was taken down in 2001, as well as your thoughts on it? Well, the Bushmen diorama originated from casts of Bushmen mm -hmm. in the 1920s. They were very lifelike, extremely lifelike. So mm -hmm. people in the 1960s, I believe it was, set up a display in the National Museum in, in Cape Town, which would purport to be a camp scene of the, uh, of the Bushmen. And it became very, very popular because people knew about the Bushmen, but then, of course, most people never came in contact with them. So this was the, the way of having a, a, a display which told you about the, how the, the Bushmen were, would live. But unfortunately, in the 1990s, uh, there was a, a debate upon, about thinking, well, that's not the Bushmen are living today. They don't live in just with skins. They don't live necessarily in a campsite because like, the world has changed. The display has become then, we call an anachronism, it has become old fashioned. Mm -hmm. And the museum, um, a lot of debate about this, but they decided that they had to uh, take it down because it really didn't represent the Bushmen today. Unfortunately, it was 
a very, very popular exhibit. Anyone of the, the age of the 1970s uh, and 80s who visited the museum would remember the, the, the diorama because of its impact upon them. But um, the people who, who are discussing this change or taking it down were academics. And I think those academics lost the plot in thinking of how can we use a diorama to talk about the history and what had happened to the Bushmen instead of just you know, taking it away. They didn't, weren't able to replace it with anything. They've got a very fine display of rock art, etc., in, in the museum today. But the history of the, the Bushmen, I think, is lost and hasn't been put together. And where it has been then re regained, as I said in the book, is in the, um, the, the Bushman um, farm for the training center on the west coast, north of Cape Town, called Kwatu. There they have a very beautiful uh, exhibit of the, uh, the Bushmen and explain to the, uh, to, to the public what happened to the Bushmen. Which I think the Bushman diorama could have been used to do the very same thing. But that initiative was, was unfortunately lost. And lastly, what else are you hoping the readers will take uh, after they've read your book? Well, I'm hoping the readers are, such, are so broad that we, we can move across just a single, uh, a single readership. I'm hoping, yes, the descendants of the, uh, the Khoisan will be, uh, will be excited about their history. But also, mm -hmm. I hope it might be uh, good for schools, because mm -hmm. I think children don't learn about Khoisan history. Some do, perhaps in junior school, but it can be brought into senior schools in discussion of what happened to people. And of course, students of, of the university who might also want to use the book. I give a huge uh, number of references. So what I talk about in a sort of general sense, if you want to dig deeper, you can do so by using the references. So if you're at UCT, for instance, you have access to all the journals, which I, I refer to, you could then dig as deep as you want. So I'm hoping it will go to a wide audience and get into the descendants of the Khoisan who feel in some ways liberated by mm -hmm. what, what was an offer because their history is very important. And let me just add to that. One of the things I point out in the book is where they're in the place of world history. The particular the Khoi And I talked about how race came about, and it's probably due to the Khoi Khoin who were so different from what the, the world, the, the, the Mediterranean world, the so-called educated world of the 15th and 16th century experienced, that they had to create new categories. The Khoi Khoi are part of that category called race. And I think that is something we, we should recognize. We're dealing with people who are on the cutting edge of mm -hmm. world history in the 15th and 16th century and what happened today. I mean, it hasn't gone away, has it? There was Andrew Smith in conversation with Polity about his book titled First People, The Lost History of Khoisan.